Welcome to part two and our application of what this word righteous or righteousness really means. Now, of course, we've used that word quite a lot today. Obviously, it's in the text and so on, and it's a very important word. But what does it actually mean? First of all, God is the ultimate standard of what is right. And so righteousness then is when one acts according to his standard. Not anybody else's standard, but God's standard. He alone is the ultimate standard of what is right. So you could say righteousness then is doing what is right as defined by God. And here's the thing about the scriptures. The scriptures make it very clear. The Bible makes it clear that no one on earth in all history has ever been righteous except Jesus. That's a stunning thing to say. Romans 3 verses 10 to 18 and 21 to 25 will be classic examples of passages talking about that very thing. Now, of course, you can appreciate with me today uh, that this sort of thing, saying something like that, raises big questions. It raises big questions in this, the 21st century, and I think it's something we need to think about and work through. All I can tell you is, is by the time I finish this, I will have simply taught standard, proper teaching, gospel teaching from the scriptures that have always been held by any true church. And so let's get to those and have a think. At the heart of the Bible, including this passage, and at the heart of the gospel itself is one central truth, and it's this, man cannot save himself. Can't do it, just can't. Man is not inherently righteous, he's not holy enough, he's not good enough, Man needs a saviour. Self is inadequate, but the saviour is adequate, fully so, through Jesus our Lord. And as you appreciate, when you say that, it creates a re reaction in people. Some people get angry, some people get irritated, some people get confused. They can't really work out how it can be so Christ-centred rather than anything to do with themselves. Because the, f the funny thing about it all is, and, and you'll have heard this before many times, many people will say, well, I do lots of good acts. I'm decent to people. I'm caring. I'm kind. And let's be honest, we've seen lots of that sort of thing during this pandemic period with people doing many benevolent acts. Of course, we've seen other side of things as well, but people do do decent acts. We know that. And I'm sure you've heard someone say something like this. People have said to me, I'm a good person, Simon. I do kind things. God will accept me as I am. And why shouldn't he, they'd say. But as I said, that's not what the scriptures teach. You see, when a person thinks in the way that I've just described, I hope you can see what they're subtly doing. They may not understand the full implication of what they're saying, but this is what they're subtly doing. When they think this way, they are saying that their own acts, their own good acts are enough, that they're good enough. More than that, they are even deciding that their acts are right, and thus those acts they're doing are righteous, and thus those acts will save them. I hope you see the logic of what I'm saying. In so doing, they're saying that they do not actually really need Jesus and his righteousness and his cross, because whether they realise it or not, they are trusting in their self rather than saviour. And this is why the scriptures in the Bible is so radical, so very different than other things. Conversely, they are effectively saying then, Jesus himself is inadequate because by trusting in their own good works, they are resting on what they can do rather than what he has done. And I know they may not quite see it in that way, in quite that way, because they wouldn't want to be necessarily rude about Jesus. But ultimately, this is what it comes down to. You either trust fully in Christ 
or you don't at all. It's one of those situations. And the thing is, by thinking that their acts are good and right, actually they've taken God's place because they have become the definers of what is right and righteous rather than letting Yahweh decide that. And in a way, that's quite an arrogant place to be. So what seemed to be quite a subtle thing at the start, actually in reality is massive. Whenever we get our focus on ourselves rather than on the Messiah, we are in trouble. That's the truth of it. Man mustn't be the focus. Messiah must be. It's about his good work and not what we think we can do. Now, with all that said, it could be that people start to think, well, what about the good acts that I do? Are they not important? Well, of course they are. And I don't think the Bible's got anything against people doing good things. Of course, I don't personally. We should always be grateful when someone does something that's good, noble, admirable, true and right. You know, Philippians 4, 8 to 9. We should always be pleased when anything of the original likeness, image and likeness of God with which we were originally made sort of shines through in our, in our world, Genesis 1, 26 to 27. But even with that concession, everyone, whoever they are, whatever good things they've done, still needs Jesus to be their righteousness. Because the truth is, we're not as good as we think we are. And why is that? Because I don't know whether you've ever noticed it, and I don't know if you've ever tried to stop sinning or not, but we always make mistakes, all of us do, and that proves something. We have a sinful nature within us, and we can't help but miss the mark. We can't stop sinning. We always fall below God's standards, even when we're trying our best. And one sin, of course, proves we've got a sinful nature. But here's the thing. The good acts we do are incapable of transforming that nature. Nature is nature, acts are acts. We could do a million decent good works, but our inner selves needs more than what we can do to save ourselves. So we may do good in some ways, of course, and praise the Lord for good things in the world, but we cannot do the necessary spiritual good to save ourselves. We don't have the ability to do the type of good we need to set ourselves free. So ABC, how do you feel about all this? How do you think perhaps people in the world may feel about this? I think there's a lot in here, and it does come out of Jeremiah 23. Paul's teaching in the New Testament would often touch on the idea of righteousness, say Romans 3, which I mentioned earlier and the, the teaching on justification. All of that is foundational to the scriptures. So these are big things, but they are the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I come to the concluding part of this talk today, I want to emphatically say this, we must never let this truth go. We must never for one moment let go of this gospel of ours. If we do, it will be the undoing of the church. This is foundational, fundamental teaching that has always been at the heart of the Bible and indeed proper church teaching. As I said a few minutes ago, we must hold on to these truths. It is never about the ancient lie of self. It is always about saviour. We need the branch. We need Messiah King. We need the one who is righteousness and who is our righteousness. And whilst this teaching may anger perhaps some people, I want to say that if we can grasp this, if it can become a revelation within the heart of a man and a woman and a boy and a girl, if we can grasp it, I tell you what this teaching is, it's freedom. It's freedom, really.
it is. You see, with Jesus in our lives, with us trusting him and trusting who he is and what he's done, God no longer needs to look at all our works, but only ever look at his son's work. Hallelujah for that truth. We no longer have to try and try and try, but simply trust in who Jesus is and what he's done. And then from that place, from that place, go and live for God in this world. Out of a love for him, rather than need to prove ourselves. What freedom, as I said, there is in this. And I think it's such an important revelation for church people, of course, as well as people who aren't Christians at all. Here's some thoughts. In every other religion in the world, there is an emphasis on your good acts and your good works. So, for example, when one gets to the end of their lives, God will look at his divine scales, his weighing scales, and he'll put the good on one part of the scale and the bad works on the other part of the scale, and he will see which one is heaviest. And if the good outweighs the bad, into heaven you can go. That's what a lot of people will say. That's what they have in their religious view. In the New Age religion, for example, we've got a slight version on this, but nevertheless, it's the same idea, the same lie, dressed up in a different way. But in the New Age religion, you'll get an emphasis on one's inner goodness and actually one's inner godness. So you get all these things, but they're all the same, really, in one way or another. Let me tell you what's going to be on my weighing scales in heaven. Jesus. That's it. None of my works. Nothing I think I've done. But Jesus. And he will outweigh everything. Everything else. Because he's all I need. And it's all you need. That's not to say our good acts in the world are not important. We need to live that out. But we don't live it so that we're saved from them. We, we just love Jesus and trust him. That's what we're to do. So I hope that knowing that Jesus is Yahweh Sid Kenu has done you good today. That his righteousness is by his grace, becomes our righteousness so that we, through him, can enter into glory one day. I hope it's done you good. I hope it's helped you to see how important the gospel truth is, that we can't lose sight of this because it is the most radical, wonderful message ever given. Jesus, our righteousness. Hallelujah. Bless you. Take care. See you soon.